and I am also direct descendant of the citizen Potawatomi. I want to acknowledge that though I am a native woman, I'm a visitor to this land, Ho-Chunk land. The Ho-Chunk have long called this region home. In 1832, a treaty was signed between the Ho-Chunk and the federal government, which forced the tribal nation to cede their territory to make way for white settlement and eventually Wisconsin statehood. In the decades to come, the federal government would wage armed assault on the Ho-Chunk, forcing them beyond the borders of what became Wisconsin territory and the state of Wisconsin. Colonial violence would not end with the forced removal of the Ho-Chunk. In the midst of the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln, whose iconic statue sits on Bascom Hill, signed the Morrill Act. This piece of legislation created the University of Wisconsin system so many know and recognize today. By creating the land-grant university system, in Wisconsin, the Treaty of 1837 alone allowed for over 1 million acres of land to be funneled into the land-grant system of 33 separate universities, more than any other single land session or land grab as they have become um, referred by Native community members today. The University of Wisconsin acquired over 235,000 acres of indigenous land to add to their endowment. I share this with you today to move beyond a traditional land acknowledgement statement. Instead, I call on each of you to sit with this discomfort and our complicity with the system, to make change, to know this history, to tell this history, to educate yourselves on dispossession and decolonization, to demand change and to not sit idly by. A great starting point in change making is the scholarship of Dr. Nick Estes, who has long advocated for honoring treaties and returning Indian land that was taken through theft and violence. This is the social justice work of the Havens Right Center, work that occurs both within the academy and beyond the walls of it, work that demands commitment and awareness work that requires critical self-reflection, careful analysis, and informed debate. Today, we welcome Dr. Nick Estes, who will share not only his scholarship with us, but his on-the-ground experience working for social justice and social change with indigenous communities. Dr. Estes is a citizen of the Lower Brule Sioux Tribe, located in central South Dakota, along the Missouri River, part of the Great Sioux Nation. Dr. Estes is an assistant professor in the Department of American Studies at the University of New Mexico, where he also earned his PhD. In early 2019, his book, Our Future, Our History is the Future, Standing Rock versus the Dakota Access Pipeline and the Long Tradition of Indigenous Resistance was published with Verso Press. The same year, he was co-editor of Standing with Standing Rock, Voices from the Hashtag No Dapple Movement, a collection of voices from Standing Rock and beyond, published with the University of Minnesota Press. In 2016, he was again co-editor of a valuable and timely online resource, Standing Rock, Hashtag No Dapple, and Mini Wakoni, which I have regularly used in my own teaching practices. Dr. Estes has published numerous and far-reaching essays, as well as book chapters and articles that center indigenous peoples, challenges ongoing settler colonialism and racism that exist all around us, and pushes for a critical look at decolonization. This week, Dr. Essies joins us for two talks on environmentalism, decolonization, and indigenous activism, echoing the mission of the Havens Right Center. I want to remind you that he joins us again tomorrow for a talk at the same time, 4 p.m. His talk tomorrow is titled Tragedy and Revolutionary Hope, climate justice and decolonization. So please visit the Havens Right Center website if you have not registered for, register for that already. But I'll turn it over to him for his talk today titled Climate Change, U.S. Imperialism and Indigenous Resistance. Please welcome Dr. Nick Estes. Uh, thank you so much, Casey, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, I'm saddened that I can't be in Wisconsin um, uh, at this moment in time. Actually, this talk was scheduled uh, for earlier this year, like I think as the United States began to acknowledge <laughs> the pandemic, um, several months behind the rest of the world. Uh, and uh, I made the hard decision of not coming to campus um, 
for safety reasons, uh, but I really appreciate uh, Patrick uh, Barrett and everyone um, who has helped uh, put this together. It's an online format. I'm gonna tell some really bad dad jokes. So um, I'm just gonna pretend that you laugh. I asked Patrick to get a, uh, to do a, uh, a laugh track, but he hasn't done that. So I'm just kidding, <laughs> just kidding. Um, but I, I, yeah, I, I, I'm happy to join you all uh, virtually. Um, and so uh, this, this I, and I also just wanna preface this talk uh, is going to be, um, you know, I think it, indigenous resistance is in the title uh, but a, a, a lot of the, the content about uh, the movements that are happening right now and going on right now is going to be in, in tomorrow's uh, talk. Uh, so that one will be a little bit more hopeful. This might be a little bit more heavy um, in thinking about the current contradictions uh, that we are facing uh, in this particular moment. Um, and obviously, um, the, talk, the title of the talk has, hasn't changed uh, from the springtime, um, even though the times that we are living in have changed. And so I'm going to uh, add in some things, especially concerning uh, the, the current pandemic and how uh, we, uh, we are responding or not responding to that, especially coming from an indigenous perspective. Um, so I'll just, I'll just begin. Um, <clears throat> Manifest destiny is an intoxicating substance. It infects the actions of US institutions and policy, but especially the minds of leaders convincing many that they are, by the grace of creator, justified in genocide, theft of a com continent, and the domination of the planet. The projection of this power has no earthly limits. America has always been a frontier nation, Trump remarked uh, at the most recent State of the Union address. Quote, now we must embrace the next frontier, America's manifest destiny in the stars. Within weeks, he issued an executive order creating the sixth branch of the military, the Space Force, to quote, organize, train, and equip military space forces to ensure unfettered access and freedom to operate in space, end quote. Two months later, the pandemic surged, millions lost their jobs in numbers exceeding the Great Depression, and healthcare workers scrambled to secure face masks and ventilators. Amid the chaos, the president signed an executive order granting the United States preemptive right, the first monopoly of claims to start mining the moon and asteroids. As more than 30 US cities, uh, cities erupted in open rebellion over, the race, over racist police terror, Trump and Pence went to Florida to watch Elon Musk's SpaceX launch an astronaut into space. Trump has elevated U.S. belligerents uh, to the level of, of, the, call of, of the cosmos uh, in, in order to colonize space. But such behavior is not without precedent. The doctrine of discovery codified in federal case law with the Johnson v. McIntosh uh, decision, uh, which happened in 1823, granted European powers preemptive rights to entire continents and nations of people. The 15th century papal decree divided the planet between the European Christian and non-Christian nations, permitting the former unrestricted access to the lands, resources, labor, and souls of the latter, the people of Africa and the Americas. Although conquest is viewed as an illegitimate form of government, it has nonetheless formed the legal basis of U.S. authority over indigenous lands and black lives. The historical consequences, the historical consequences of which later informed what W.E.B. Du Bois defined as the problem of the 20th century, the problem of the color line, the struggle between the lighter and darker nations, a problem in the 21st century demarcated by the richer and poorer nations. And just to be clear, the, the doctrine of discovery isn't something that is you know, just embraced by the right. The late uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg um, also embraced the racist doctrine uh, as something you know, to uphold uh, in reference to indigenous sovereignty. And she in fact had a, uh, you know, if she's notorious for anything, it's notorious on her anti-tribal sovereignty stance. So I think that's worth pointing out that this isn't just some kind of anomaly 
or fluke that um, you know white supremacists uh, hold, but it's actually in fact something that liberals themselves embrace. The present global division of humanity concerns those who live with war and suffering and those who live in countries that perpetuate it. A system that is not only divided by racial and imperial designs, but one that also enshrines them. The division of the world, um, <clears throat> divisions of the world are most acu acute in this land. In Minnesota, the descendants of slave patrols and settler militias tried to terrorize and snuff out black life, whether with guns, without them, or just bare hands, uh, is what makes the police dangerous and the badge that authorizes them to beat, maim, and kill with impunity. There are those who have historically rejected this reality and will continue to do so. But the color line that stretches across both uh, time and space definitely burns with great intensity in this current moment and time. And I'd also you know, like to just say that although we think of police violence as something that is categorized or can be confined to the issue of like social justice. I would say that police violence in this day and age, and you know, like I'll, I'll make this case in this talk tonight, that police violence itself is also a climate justice issue because it's a fundamentally about class rule. Um, and there's desperate, you know, search uh, for reason behind tragedy in this current moment. The U.S. deceit and distortion surrounding the response to the coronavirus is so sadly familiar that a death toll exceeding 200,000 has lost its power to shock. The lives of the poor, especially Black and Indigenous, don't possess the same sanctity as private property. They never have. That much is evident in the way white America has reacted to coronavirus and Black-led uprisings against police terror. Many label it unprecedented times and are drawing attention to the uneven impact of the virus on non-white and poor communities uh, and in particular indigenous people. The disparities are certainly true, but history provides a better lens to understand the present and potential future to come in a post-pandemic world, a world that will nevertheless be one of climate chaos, an apocalyptic future that has already arrived. For, for the indigenous, there's pl plenty of precedent and not, and not one virus, but a centuries old plague, or centuries old plagues. Uh, and one of them would be the transformation of fossil fuels into carbon dioxide, which is intrinsically linked to capital accumulation on one hand, but it is also linked to the, uh, linked to the birth of racial capitalism and its specific iteration in settler colonialism on the other hand. The transatlantic slave trade initially provided labor for the sugar industry in the Americas. Then came King Cotton in the South, whose rise correlated uh, with the rise of the steam engine and the Cottonopolis, as it was called, uh, and the crystallization of the wage in Manchester, England in the first half of the 19th century. But whose hands picked this cotton? And upon whose land was this cotton grown? Modern industrial capitalism was only possible because of African slavery and the proletarianization of the European masses and the genocide of indigenous people and the theft of their lands. In other words, it required the underdevelopment of two continents, the indigenous Americas and Africa. A core feature of settler colonialism is not just the elimination of the native but also the naturalization of unnatural settler states built on the annexation of indigenous land and the genocide of indigenous people. And while it's been argued by scholars such as Patrick Wolf that elimination of the native isn't just the elimination of the native because they hate their culture, their language, their worldview, uh, but it's tied to accessing the land, right? I think what I would argue and what I, you know, what I'm trying to argue tonight is that it's more than just access to land. It's clearly tied to an accumulation scheme, right? That we call capitalism. It's about the profit motive. Um, and I think that often gets kind of, uh, I think it's suggested in indigenous studies understanding of settler colonialism, but it's not often foregrounded. Historian uh, Manu Karuga, 
provides a cogent critique of settler colonialism, reconceiving it more accurately as continental imperialism. And I think this is a very important contribution. From this perspective, when we read Frederick Jackson Turner's fr frontier thesis alongside Lenin's imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism through the lens of native and indigenous studies, we are presented with a, different, a series of different questions in understanding the nature of the United States. There is no national territory in the United States, according to Karuga, nor is there a national political economy. Quote, only an imperial one, which continues to be maintained, not through the rule of law, contract, or competition, but through the renewal of colonial occupation. End quote. Put another way, Turner wrote, the closing, wrote of the closing of the frontier as a sort of end of history scenario, kind of in, this, in the same vein as Fukuyama. Understanding the United States as driven fundamentally by land-based territorial acquisitions through war and treaties, and whose political and economic engine was the frontier. The sudden transformation of that project, Turner lamented, arrived when there was no longer a frontier county reported on the 1890 US Census. What was left for the United States to conquer? Lenin conceived of imperialism as driven by monopoly and capital, not trade and discovery. We can understand this in the best, er, this best in the way the United States rapidly expanded. In less than a century from its original boundaries in 18, or 1784, beginning with the first 13 colonies, the United States annexed nearly 2 billion, uh, 2 billion acres of territory, most of which was west of the, of the uh, Mississippi River. The annexation of territory also further expanded the system of plantation slavery the earliest form of capital accumulation in the United States. And while not considered a global su superpower until the 20th century, by 1840, the United States had the highest gross domestic product in the world. This was due to a lucrative e enterprise of the cotton kingdom of the South. And the reason why this is, is important, because oftentimes the US isn't considered an imperialist power until after the Spanish-American War in the, in the, at the end of the 19th century. Some people have pushed it back to the end of the Civil War, um, but clearly just by you know, the, the idea that it's, uh, the, or the gross domestic product in 1840, that it was, you know, it was clearly an imperialist power from, its, from the inception. It wasn't just something that happened overnight, and especially if we think of the annexation of territory as, as being fundamental to kind of an imperialist um, an, uh, an imperialist design. Um, as, as the United States took indigenous territory, it brought that territory into its orbit on the conditions of whether or not the state would allow African, uh, state would allow African slavery. And this has led to all kinds of things that we have today, like the minoritarian rule of like the electoral college and, and the Senate. Um, um, Thus, the two destiny, uh, two destiny or destinies of African and indigenous people are intertwined. And Karl Marx began his exegesis of capital in this moment in history, right? When English factories spun cotton picked by African hands on stolen land from indigenous people. And it was a time when the steam engine became the heartbeat of the English cotton mill. The fossil economy as we know it today, which has been the primary progenitor of capitalist driven global warming would not have been possible without African slavery, indigenous genocide, and the proletarianization of European peasants, to repeat my, my main argument. Hundreds of indigenous nations were consumed by this process of relentless westward expansion. And imagine if US historians treated those indigenous national histories with the same rigor and consistency as they do uh, other non-indigenous nations. Imagine if, imagine if students and public schools were required to learn not only indigenous place names, but also the hundreds of languages and philosophies of this immense body of human diversity and knowledge. Understood from this perspective, native and indigenous studies scholars have argued not only that the United States is a settler nation, but, it, but that it is also an invader nation. The, the organic anti-imperialism of indigenous people who firmly grasp this history and who are by default political for simply having survived genocide, has fueled some of the most compelling critiques of imperialist state sovereignty and the very idea that the United States is a legitimate nation. 
After all, conquest you know, is considered an illegitimate form of government. Indigenous nationhood, however, is premised on relationships, not invasion or coercion. And you know, as, as, a, as, a, as a way to kind of contrast uh, ideas of sovereignty, for example, we understand something like settler sovereignty as being distinct from something like indigenous sovereignty, whereas settler sovereignty is based primarily on exclusion and, uh, from like certain territories, right? And we can see this in the way that the United States has built um, uh, a history of laws that dispossess certain people from owning property um, or becoming property, um, or the way that it excludes people from citizenship uh, uh, through its racial regimes and ideas of uh, who belongs and who doesn't. As contrasted to indigenous sovereignty, which is fundamentally about relations to the land and a duty, you know, a duty to um, have reciprocity with the land itself. And I think that's an important distinction to, to make. It's not just that like indigenous people picked up the term sovereignty and began applying it wholesale to their, to their experience. Dakota anthropologist Kim Talbert argues that indigenous people became pro uh, people in relation to other life forms which included understandings of life beyond the pale of Western forms of science that considers some things more or less alive than others. Thus elimination is a, is a tactic of settler colonialism, uh, erasure, disappearance, and the killing of native people also attacked indigenous relations with other humans uh, through policies such as child removal and family separation or non-humans. An attack on indigenous relations, in other words, is an attack on indigenous nationhood. Um, and we can see this in the way that uh, policy in the 19th century, um, as I document in my book, Our History is the Future, uh, targeted the destruction of the remaining buffalo herds in the West as a way to break um, the, the indigenous nation's resistance on the plains. Uh, and, you know, even going, if, if you look at 19th century wars, against indigenous people, many of them, you know, occurred over food and, and just in, you know, so for example, just in my nation, the Ochete Shakomi, uh, the, the 1862 U.S. Dakota War began when starving uh, Dakota people um, decided to steal uh, chicken eggs from a, a white farmer, right, because they were denied uh, a credit at a storehouse Right, and then subsequently burn those storehouse, storehouses to the, the ground, much in the way that we saw uh, people who burned um, uh, uh, stores to the ground in Minneapolis, right? Uh, because they didn't own them. They were, they were creating a debtor relationship, right? And then later on you had, uh, in the 1850s, you had the Mormon cow war, which was fought over um, Lakota people um, who were disallowed from hunting in, in, uh, in the, the Powder River Basin, killing, uh, a cow of a Mormon settler who was trespassing through their land, right? And it began this war, right? Um, so it's interesting how like food uh, plays like an important role, but it goes back to uh, those relations that indigenous people had with that land in place. In Minnesota, in the U.S. Dakota War, it was over uh, restrictions of hunting into cer in certain areas and the curtailing or the curtailment of indigenous modes of production through uh, the corn harvest and the wild rice harvest. And I could, I would probably say that most of those conflicts, um, you know, in the West specifically happened over the question of food and the, the ability of indigenous peoples to biologically and socially reproduce themselves on the land and in, in relation to the land. So when, when should we, you know, while reading, to go back to uh, this connection between uh, racial capitalism and, and settler colonialism, um, when should we, while reading Walter Rodney's How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, or the chapters on primary accumulation in Marx's Capital, Volume 1. Not simply because these are past events, but because they're ongoing. The immense loss of life and humanity under the throes of capitalism is absolutely unimaginable in terms of the sufferings, suffering it has caused and continues to cause. While we typically measure capital's destructive power by what profits are reaped at the expense of a large section of humanity, the African Marxist Emil Clark Cabral asks us to return to the source. The source is what defines the historical nature of continu continued militant resistance that shapes certain struggles. But it is also the root of what could bloom into beauty if allowed to grow properly. Capitalism and imperialism have maldeveloped the continents of Africa and the Americas. Imagine what the vast continents would be like had they not suffered the crimes 
um, they have. Imagine the knowledge, you know, the art, books, science, and technology, the beauty of humanity that was lost and destroyed. We cannot change the past, but we certainly live in a present entirely structured by our past. And for that, we are responsible. Um, and in, in tomorrow's talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what it means to dream in this moment and what, we, what can grow in the absence or what is growing in the absence of empire. Um, we might ask why are race and white supremacy in this particular moment um, central or how are they central to a growing class consciousness? Uh, I would argue that the, the uprisings uh, following George Floyd's murder have actually, and also the uh, Black Lives Matter movement has, has raised not just the, the consciousness around race in this country, but also class consciousness in general, because we have not, we simply have not seen these kinds of um, uh, working class struggles in the streets uh, in, in such a militant way uh, in recent history. And, and I also want to make, you know, the argument again, that this, this, that this shouldn't just be seen in isolation as a quote unquote racial conflict or like identity politics, but that it directly relates to how we understand capital or uh, climate change. Um, it also raised, you know, questions around, you know, um, the histories of Black and Indigenous uh, resistance and how they can inform how we understand imperialism uh, and capitalism in this moment. And I just want to run through some of the arguments, uh, the main arguments and in, in ideas of racial capitalism. So for example, uh, the British Marxist Stuart Hall gave us language to help us understand the current conjuncture. He writes, race is the modality in which class is lived. It is also the medium in which class relations are experienced. Therefore, it determines modes of struggle and the adequacy, I think that's a key word, the adequacy of struggle to structure, uh, to the structures it aims to transform, end quote. Although Hall was writing about Britain under Margaret Thatcher, the lesson helps us understand the current moment. The abolitionist Ruth Gilmore Wilson builds on Hall when she argues that capitalism is, requires inequality and racism enshrines it. Neither class nor race, however, are fixed identities. Class is fundamentally about power. And I think this is an, an important point to make because I think people, uh, there's all these kind of interpretations of class, but I think a simple, a simple definition is that class is about power on a, on a micro and a macro scale. Put another way, class is a relation of power. It is exercised through the domination of one class over another. It operates on different scales between boss and worker, Oppress, oppressor and oppressed between colonizer nation and colonized nation. Thus class expresses itself through race, colonial gender and sexual relations of power and many other vectors to be sure. The dynamics of class, of class movements emerge in different convergences of struggle, writes historian Christina Heatherton. Our theories, uh, she, she continues, have to be capacious enough to account for these convergences. A categorical dismissal of identity politics, a concept with, with its own misuses and abuses, fails to show how groups of, and entire nations of people confront power and thus become politicized by the historical process. Uh, and I would, I would make the argument that, you know, and I'm gonna talk about this um, tomorrow. Um, I'm not just gonna keep saying that, I'll talk about it tomorrow, but I think uh, a, an example that I'm going to elaborate on tomorrow is that if we think about indigenous pipeline struggles, or even, you know, temperature checks, health checkpoints on reservations. Those uh, in some ways are, uh, are, are, are an, an enactment or a, a manifestation of a certain kind of class politics, right? When we see workers picketing a company or a business, uh, if, you, if you wanna stand in solidarity with them, you don't cross the picket line, right? Um, when there's a blockade going up against a pipeline, we have to ask ourselves what kind of class solidarity uh, exists when unionized pipeline workers go to work that day, crossing that indigenous picket line, because the jobs and the livelihoods of indigenous people are on the line, and that's why they're protesting, right? Um, and that's what I would, that's what I would, you know, I, that's what I think what Christina Heatherton is saying in this piece. It's like, how, you know, how do we, um, how do we account for these convergences, these historical convergences? 
and it's not just identity politics, you know, in, in the sense of like indigenous people protecting land. Um, and I'll get into that tomorrow. <laughs> um, but I also think that it's, it's important to, to recognize that, there, that the, the theories of racial capitalism and the black radical tradition have very much informed uh, this kind of point uh, in time. And I would argue that um, because of indigenous traditions of resistance, uh, which I write about quite extensively in my book, um, also informed this moment in time. I think uh, Standing Rock uh, was very much a, a catapult for many different kinds of uh, politics and de many different kinds of movements. I remember um, reading as the George Floyd protests began to erupt around the city, uh, some water protectors who had been at Standing Rock, not all of whom were indigenous, by the way, some of whom were black and some of whom uh, were white, were commenting that now Standing Rock is everywhere, right? Um, and I think the returning to the historian Cedric Robinson, you know, he locates the origins of the black radical tradition as arising from a distinct African experience. The transatlantic uh, slave trade and the plantation system it fed paradoxically dehumanized Africans while also exploiting their humanity. It reduced human beings to units of property. It also exploited in the most nightmarish ways imaginable, whether through natal alienation or through the daily torture of bondage, the very faculties of humanness that form the fundamental basis of capitalism, labor and its reproduction, right? What arose from the centuries long experience, which lives on today, was a culture of liberation. That historical class consciousness um, owes its origins not solely to the creation of a new, of a, a European new world in the Americas, its mother is Africa. And Robinson writes, you know, Marx had not realized, this is a quote, Marx had not realized that the cargoes of laborers uh, also contain African cultures, critical mixes and admixtures of language and thought, of cosmology and metaphysics, of habits, beliefs, and morality. These were the actual terms of their humanity. These cargoes then did not consist of intellectual isolates or deculturated blacks, men and women and children separated from their previous universe. African labor brought the past with it, a past that has produced it and settled on it, the first elements of consciousness and comprehension, end quote. So to understand the origins of the black radical tradition, Robinson begins his analysis in Europe where racial capitalism began. It was here after all where Europe before it began, uh, before it began its planetary enterprise of colonization, colonized itself. In his formulation, capitalism was not a radical break or rupture from European feudalism or the old order. In many ways, it was the continuation of it. Racialism, that's his term, was seeded in European social orders before the dawn of capitalism, creating racial hierarchies that formed early class structures. Uh, the racially subordinated Europeans, if, not, if they were not outright eliminated, normally labored and worked the land on behalf of the ruling classes. Immigrant workers were usually placed at the bottom of the racial hierarchy. And before Du Bois', du Bois darker and lighter nations, the Slavs and Irish were the wretched of the earth, or the wretched of Europe, who, did, who would not achieve whiteness alongside their fellow Europeans in the United States until the 19th century. This is not to say racism did not exist historically in other societies. Rather, it shows how the root of modern anti-Blackness, which is tied to the system of chattel slavery and its afterlives and settler colonialism, which is tied to the indigenous genocide and the theft of the continent, had its origins in Europe. And during the so-called age of discovery, this racial system was exported to the rest of the world a brutal series of enclosures removed direct producers from the land and forced them into sell their labor in the form of wage, say, uh, wage in the factory. Witch hunts eradicated communal relations and subjected the social power of women and children to the drudgery of domestic work and biological and social reproduction. Um, and this is something that uh, the, the feminist scholar Sylvia Federici documents in her book, uh, Caliban and the Witch. She writes the history of Europe before, con before the conquest is sufficient proof that Europeans did not have to cross the oceans to find the will to exterminate those standing in the way. The surplus populations, mostly from the lower classes, that the factory systems couldn't absorb, were sent to the Americas as frontier fodder 
where, coloniz where the colonization project continued. And I think this is important um, to remember because you know, the idea of um, trauma discourse within indigenous studies is very prevalent, but I think what's fundamental about understanding trauma or this term historical trauma is that trauma flows not from history, right? But trauma flows from not having a future at all. And I think this is something that I've, you know, I've been dwelling on for quite some time. Um, and especially in the ways um, that we understand this current, this current moment of imperialist wars, of climate change, uh, and resistant to, a resistance to it. And I would argue that most historians, you know, my profession, have failed to draw what are obvious connections um, from the conditions created by war, invasion, and colonialism to our current moment, right? And specifically, if we think about the rates of infection uh, of COVID virus among uh, black indigenous uh, and Latinx communities as being higher than, you know, the general population, but specifically uh, the white population. We can understand that this isn't just some kind of like, you know, pre-existing condition, right? That they're not exacerbated by a, a biological pre-existing condition, because I believe that the idea that, um, that um, uh, indigenous people or black people are biologically inferior goes back to a whole host of myths, uh, especially surrounding the colonization of this continent. And the idea that the majority of indigenous people weren't killed or weren't exterminated or eliminated by war um, and invasion, but in fact had been wiped out by disease. Um, and we only need to look at the cholera outbreak in Yemen to understand uh, the relationship between US foreign policy and heightened rates of infection, like by disease, right? No one is disputing the fact that millions of, uh, the infection of millions uh, but, you know, with cholera and the deaths of thousands at the hand of this preventable disease are the result of a US-backed Saudi-led war, which has destroyed Yemen's healthcare infrastructure and much more. It also shouldn't surprise us to learn that one fourth of surgical amputations in Iraq, Syria, Yemen, or in Yemen, are the results of uh, are the result of diabetes, according to uh, the Red, according to a study by the Red Cross. The three countries have been the staging ground for U.S.-backed military interventions and invasions that have disrupted critical food and medical supply chains. Oftentimes, disease, famine, and lack of health care. Uh, kill as much, if not more, than Washington bullets, right? And I think this is an important fact to remember when we think about the colonization of the Americas and the, the, the rampant spread of uh, communicable diseases. It's easy to think that, oh, most people just died of disease uh, and not the conditions of war that exacerbate uh, the, the symptoms of those diseases, right? Or the spread of those diseases when somebody is malnourished, when somebody is constantly moving, when somebody you know, is, is, uh, is facing um, uh, heightened kind of like strains and stresses, it makes them more susceptible to these diseases. Um, and we can think about like this in terms of how the United States uh, and other European powers um, dominate the rest of the world through uh, economic sanctions. And economic sanctions, uh, frequently hailed by politicians uh, of all stripes as a humane alternative to war, simply war by another means. The U.S. currently sanctions 39 countries, which makes up one third of humanity. Think about that. One third of humanity is currently under U.S. sanctions, which causes currency inflation and the devaluation and upsetting of the distribution of medicine, food, power, water treatment, and other human needs. A 2019 report by the Center for Economic and Policy Studies found that U.S. sanctions on Venezuela accounted for 40,000 or more than 40,000 deaths and a loss of at least $6 billion in oil revenue between 2017 and 2018. Uh, as, Iran, as Iran experienced uh, increased rates of coronavirus infection, the country faced medical supply storages because of U.S. sanctions. While countries under U.S. sanctions like China and Cuba provided international aid, to other countries suffering from the pandemic, the United States was not only handling, uh, handling it the worst, 
in some cases doing nothing, which needlessly allowed thousands to die, hundreds of thousands to die, but it was also preventing other countries from adequately responding. And I would make an argument that this kind of behavior is the same kind of behavior when we think about climate change, right? Um, and I'll get, into, I'll get into that at the end of this talk. Um, but as much as the, you know, the United States is holding back you know, the rest of the world from adequately addressing um, COVID-19, you know, it's 5% of the world's population, but I think we account for around 20% of the current uh, cases. I'm not sure about um, the deaths, um, but we're also holding back the rest of the world from adequately addressing climate change because we are the number one producer of, of, of um, emissions. Um, and, you know, there's the old stat of like, if the rest of the world, the rest of the world's people consumed as much as the United States as the average US citizen, we would need three planets, right? Three Earths to survive. And this is why, you know, tribal nations such as Cheyenne River, the old Glala Sioux tribe and my own tribe, the Lower Pearl Sioux tribe, uh, have set up health checkpoints on the reservation boundaries because governors like Christy Noem, who's the governor of South Dakota, uh, operate on a, a policy of make-believe. We will not apologize for being an island of safety in a, a sea of uncertainty and death, the Shine River uh, chairman wrote the governor. It is also why Native nations have the highest rate of, of infection to this day, while the United States has enriched itself on stolen uh, resources, the indigenous pay the highest costs. Um, and we can think about this in the way that the United States has used indigenous land and resources to exert dominance over the rest of the world. And it wasn't just to build, it, it wasn't only just to build um, its economic kind of base or its economy off of stolen land, but it also weaponized those lands. And I think the, the, the most compelling case of this is the US created the first nuclear bomb by mining uranium on Nav Navajo lands, which poisoned generations of, of families. Uh, and also building a weapon of mass destruction, like at Los Alamos Labs here in, in New Mexico, on a sacred Tewa Mesa, right? The bomb, the, the, the uranium that was mined for the atomic bomb that was dropped on, or the atomic bombs that was dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki came uh, from this region, right? The bombs that were invented here in, uh, in, Tewa, in Tewa territory, or Tewa territory, this was to extend, the goal was to extend the threat of global nuclear holocaust to the entire world if it didn't fall in line with US hegemony, right? Um, and it's also upon uh, Navajo Nation lands, uh, which helped launch the United States as the number one oil producer in the world, um, that also has the most, the highest rates of infection. And some, you know, some rates of infection are higher than most countries. Um, and it's, it's important to remember that one third of the Navajo Nation population lives without um, uh, adequate access to electricity or running water in, some, in their homes. While the coal uh, from its lands fuel power plants and the water from its rivers soaks golf courses in Phoenix, Arizona, right? The disease in this case is not so much coronavirus as it is resource colonization. And think about this in terms of how Trump now wants to colonize the moon, right? We're gonna mine the moon in the middle of a pandemic. Um, so we might, we might think of this current moment of climate catastrophe and corona shock as a mighty accelerator, to use Lenin's, word, uh, use Lenin's words, which he also says, you know, engendering worldwide crises of unparalleled intensity driving nations like the United States, you know, to use his words again, to the brink of doom. In Lenin's time, the gamble was World War I. The deadly, con the deadly global conflict, however, didn't diminish his hostility to it, um, quite the contrary. But it did become a way to rally a revolutionary movement of workers to take power. And if we think about this idea, the mighty accelerator is what he calls it, and we think about the language that the Pentagon uses. The Pentagon refers to climate change as a quote unquote threat multiplier, 
Um, and it used this language in a 2015 congressional report detailing how strategic commands as a matter of necessity um, are integrating climate change into their global counterinsurgency operations. The intelligence, the intelligence community's 2019 worldwide threat assessment warns environmental degradation and climate change, quote, are likely to fuel um, competition for resources, economic distress, and social discontent in the present and near future by threatening infrastructure, health, and water and food security, end quote. And according to a June 19th intelligence briefing that, uh, that Trump tried to suppress, the State Department cautions that because of climate change, what are considered local problems, in their words, in Sub-Saharan Africa, the Middle East, and Central and Southeast Asia make the regions especially vulnerable for unrest that could spill over with global con uh, consequences. The goal then is containment, you know, Fortress America, Fortress Europe. In other words, the threat multiplier is 20, 22 million potential climate refugees. The military, which has long produced reports about climate impacts, is already grow, going green by focusing on national security, which means protecting the welfare of the first world and specifically US citizens and its economic interests while per portraying those in the third world who suffer the worst effects of warming temperatures as quote unquote security threats. And CO2 emissions themselves are clearly bound up with class society, which is highlighted by uh, two striking reports. Um, <clears throat> one found that one tenth of, of, of the human species accounts for half of all present emissions from, uh, from consumption, half the species for one tenth. The richest 1% have a carbon footprint some 175 times larger than those of the poorest Hondurans, Mozambicans, or Rwandans. Share of the CO2 accumulated since 1820, going thinking about steam engines, right, are similarly skewed. Some you know, it, it, I think it's important to understand that the ecological crisis should be also manifest a certain kind of class, you know, <laughs> hatred um, towards uh, these billionaires who account for the majority of the carbon footprint. When, when we think about climate change and we think about um, the ways that a lot of this, uh, the the necessity of climate mitigation is, is transferred onto individual behaviors. If I drive less, if I take public transportation, if I take shorter showers, you know, if I eat, uh, if I don't eat meat, is somehow going to change uh, these relations of power. It's completely false, but it's an easy strategy. It's like a total neoliberal strategy to, to outsource that responsibility onto individual behavior and not to look at the class relations of power. And even if we understand, you know, that one, you know, that the richest one percent have a footprint, you know, higher than uh, 175 times higher than uh, the poorest on this planet. That should be enough, right? That should be enough to understand that this is a system that isn't the responsibility. You know, when we say the Anthropocene, right? This is a common term that we've heard. Uh, the Anthropocene, it's it's the it's ushered in a new era, a new geological era, right? That is fundamentally uh, defined by climate change, and specifically the fossil economy. Anthro means human, correct? This idea that humans, humanity as a whole is responsible for climate change, I think is fundamentally incorrect, right? And there's some other folks like Jason Moore who talk about the capitalist scene, uh, but I've just preferred to call it what it is. It's just capitalism, right? <laughs> the dawn of capitalism has created the current ecological crisis as well as the current you know, quote unquote, racial crisis that we're experiencing in this particular uh, uh, moment in time. Um, and I think it's also important to remember in this, in this moment, when we're faced with kind of two choices in this country, you know, the, the, we're letting them define these choices, right? I'm not saying that this is something that uh, everyone believes in. Between neoliberal restoration as represented by somebody like Joe Biden, who's hearkening back to the legacy of Obama, right? Or neoliberal reaction, which is represented by Trump, um, 
that we are not, those aren't really, those aren't real alternatives in this particular moment in time. If we've been looking at this long history of racial capitalism, its iteration in settler colonialism, and the creation of the modern class system, and also uh, the current crisis of, of um, climate change. And it's, if we just look at the past two administrations, Obama's energy strategy was one of, of energy, what he called energy independence. And what did he achieve under energy independence? You know, his, he took office right after or right during the, um, the 2008 Great Recession. Under his administration, domestic oil and gas production increased by 88%. This included the creation of hundreds of miles uh, or thousands of miles of, of oil pipelines. Um, three quarters of Keystone XL was built under Obama's administration. He only, he only vetoed uh, the quarter of the, the northern leg of it, which, trans, or which uh, crossed the international border. But also the Dakota Access Pipeline was built under his watch as well. And this is largely due to what's called the fracking revolution, right? Um, and under, under Obama's administration, we see a tightening of the screws of sanctions on Venezuela to wean the United States off of Venezuelan produced oil. Going back to uh, the sanctions, uh, the conversations around sanctions um, that we were talking about earlier, um, that this was a geopolitical strategy on behalf of the United States and specifically under the Obama administration to develop, to create energy independence by solely focusing on building uh, the energy infrastructure of the United States off the fossil fuel economy. This transformed under, uh, under Trump, because Trump, love him or hate him, has a beautiful way uh, with language in what he called unleashing America's energy dominance, right? So we go from the Obama administration's energy independence to unleashing America's energy dominance on the world. Um, and this, you know, this, this uh, dovetailed with um, the fast track approval of certain pipelines, uh, the Keystone XL, the Dakota Access Pipeline, uh, as, real, as well as rolling back environmental protections. Um, and we can see, you know, of course, this, this, this uh, current situation has changed a bit because the oil economy has, or the fossil fuel economy has also taken a hit uh, because of the, the pandemic. Um, but nonetheless, I think it's important to put the United States uh, into kind of a geopolitical context uh, with uh, uh, North American energy dominance over uh, the rest of the world. And, and, and in that case, a lot of people turn to Canada as a, as a uh, viable solution, right? Oh, we need uh, social democratic reforms like Canada. We need free healthcare. We need um, social security uh, uh, enlargement. Um, like the Canadian system has, you know, we need the kind of uh, welfare state that the Canadian system has. But it's important to remember that Canada has been working hand in hand with the United States uh, with these economic sanctions against countries like Venezuela and the blockade on Cuba. Um, but Canada is also home to at least 60% of the world's mining corporations. And 80% of the Canadian economy is tied to the US. And so what does that mean? You know, um, it, even with that kind of social democracy comes the extractive relation and the kind of imperialist relations of power um, uh, that we're seeing uh, the United States exert, right? They just have a nicer face to it. And the, and the Canadian Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, actually uses the words decolonization, which is really <laughs> fascinating to me. I, I want to see a picture. I want to see a video of him saying that in blackface. You know, <laughs> The question isn't how often did uh, Dustin Trudeau, uh, you know, wear blackface or brownface? It's it's the question is how often hasn't he been in brownface and blackface? Uh, but it's also, I think it's it's a kind of a sign of the times, and we can we can look at something like that and say, wow, that's really racist, but not understand that Canada fundamentally on a if we think about the geopolitics of Canada as, as an extractive state, is is more is more racist than just kind of the projection of anti-black. Or, um, uh, or anti-black racism of, of wearing blackface. Um, so let's not be fooled by that mask, you know, no pun intended, um, that Canada tries to wear in, in this, but also not, not be fooled by the way that the United States has also, um, you know, projected this kind of racial project um, from that it's, it's perfected in its own lands to other, to other places on the planet. 
Um, so we can, you know, this, I, I, I'm going to skip over some of this uh, stuff because I'm going to talk about it tomorrow. Um, but I think it's important to, you know, to, to really think about, um, you know, if we're, if we're really, I think in this moment in time, there's several alternatives that are, are being proposed, you know, so really taxing the rich um, by drastically sa uh, slashing the carbon production or consumption of the richest 1%. Uh, we can see already a reaction to that, right? Even something as I, I would say that doesn't go far enough, something that like the Green New Deal is being baited as, uh, you know, communist or like, you know, socialistic uh, policy in the United States. But it's caused such a reaction, not just by the right, but also um, the liberal, uh, the liberal wing of the Democratic Party as something completely untenable. So too is Medicare for all, right? Even mild reforms uh, become a, an impossibility in this moment. Um, so a revolution against the symptoms, right, targets exploiters and oppressors in the immediate vicinity. And that immediate vicinity for indigenous people is oil pipelines, right? That immediate vicinity in black communities is credit, you know, uh, payday lending and stores, right? Because um, if indigenous people have been dispossessed of their land and white folks and uh, white settlers have become owners of that land, right? If we think about agricultural lands in this country, 95% of them are owned by white people, 95%. In, in South, uh, South African apartheid, or under South African apartheid, white people made up 5% of the population and owned 70% of the land, right? So if you want to think about that in numbers. Um, but this, you know, this current moment in time, the pandemic has galvanized a certain kind of uh, class consciousness, I would say, and, under, and especially in this country, we're living in the quote unquote wealthiest nation in the world, but have the highest rates of coronavirus um, and the, the, you know, some of the, the most deaths of any country. So it can't, when we talk about revolution against uh, the symptoms, it targets the exploiters and the, 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 the oppressors in the immediate vicinity, but it's also um, it hopefully going to evolve into a revolution against the causes um, that mobilize uh, the masses, you know, in the United States and across the globe. And that thinking about all struggles as struggles against fossil capital, thinking about the, the inability of, you know, black communities to have autonomy and self-determination over their, over their neighborhoods because of, you know, racist police terror is preventing them from even having the opportunity to potentially, you know, work and you know, grow their own food on land that belongs, you know, that that should um, you know be used for the benefit of everybody, right? Not to mention the fact that indigenous peoples um, don't have access to that land to begin with. So all struggles are struggles against fossil capital. And if we think about it in this particular moment in time, the subjects, uh, the subjects or the you know the people who are in the streets only need be uh, only need to be made aware of it. And we have to act in this particular moment with exist, existential urgency and to understand that it's not just about, you know, abolition uh, of the police, but understanding that the abolition of the police creates uh, the opportunity to build a political, po or political power in this country or elsewhere to actually demand or to uh, exercise and manifest the changes necessary to address climate change. Um, the United States operates on incredibly stupid premises. The Standing Rock intellectual Vine Deloria Jr. wrote a half a century ago, and Custer died for your sins. It fails to understand the nature of the world, so it does not develop policies that can hold the allegiance of the people, he writes. Put simply, the United States only knows violence. It convinces through force, but it cannot be convinced by force or even, its, even the possibility of its own death. Any attempt to assemble a coherent, a coherent master narrative ends in failure. It saw global warming coming de decades ago and did nothing. In fact, it was sped up. It saw a pandemic unfolding months in advance and did nothing. It sees police murdering and torturing black people every day, but blames outside agitators, right? So when black people defend themselves, um, oh, excuse me, it sees indigenous genocide un unfold before its very eyes, but blames quote unquote pre-existing conditions. When confronted with science and hard facts, 
the United States chooses hallucination and make believe. We are the tribe they cannot see, the late Dakota poet John Trudell once said. His message is clear. Colonialism is not only a contest over territory, but also over the meaning of life itself. The sonic vibrations of the words Indian or Native American, all make-believe vocabularies, never penetrated the, air rate, the airwaves of the lands now called America until European invasion. As much as words like Native, Indian, and America try to explain, they in fact obscure and erase. When Columbus and his men first asked, first asked the Arawaks who they were, they responded in their language, we are human beings. Ah, the Indians, Columbus said. We have been called many names, Trudeau remarks, listing other such labels, hostile, pagan, militant, that have become synonymous with indigenous in the grammar of colonialism. The colors of names cannot see us, but we can see them, he says. We are the hallucination. The hallucination, here as he says, hallucination, is, isn't hallucinatory in and of itself. The hallucination exists in the minds of those who possess what Trudell calls the Columbus mentality, the inability to see human beings as being human. So thank you. Thanks so much, Nick, for that fascinating talk um, and incredibly insightful analysis. Uh, one of the strange things right now is that usually there'd be lots of applause and uh, sorry, but uh, I can see lots of people ca uh, clapping uh, in little video screens anyway. Uh, so thanks very much. Because we're running a little bit short of time, I think we're going to skip the breakout uh, groups and move right into uh, a question and answer session. Just before I do that, though, uh, and anyone leaves, I just want to say the uh, talk about the continu continuity of the talks that the Haven's Rights Centre is putting on this semester. Not only is Nick uh, going to be back with us tomorrow, and I encourage you, if you haven't already registered for that event, please do so now. But next week, Arun Kundanani uh, will be giving a single lecture on what is racial capitalism. And indeed, we'll be drawing on Stuart Hall and others. So uh, it will be covering a lot of the themes uh, that Nick has started exploring with us today. So I'd urge you to go to the Havens Rights Centre website uh, uh, and look at the full itinerary of events that we have going on this semester. OK, so here's how the Q&A is going to work. Obviously, it can be a little bit hard to run on Zoom, but if you click on the participants button uh, at the bottom of your screen, uh, there you should see a little button that says raise hand. If you click on that, I will see that you want to come in with a question uh, and I will unmute you um, so that you can ask Nick a question. How does that sound? Who would like to go first? We've got 20 minutes of Q&A. Okay, I have uh, Matthew Sample, I'll bring you in. Hey Nick, thanks so much. So I, I'm curious if you could maybe extend your reflections on how the sort of the manifest destiny and violence is built into the nation building project, including its most important institutions like law and justice. And I'm curious, does that also extend into science, technology, and especially academia. I'm an academic researcher, so I feel like a lot of the basic principles structuring these other important institutions, including ones we need right now, like public health, it seems like that they also participate to some extent in this sort of violent logic. And I was just curious if you could say a little bit about that. Thanks very much, Matthew. Just before I bring Nick back in, because we're a bit short on time, I'm gonna take uh, two or three questions at a time for Nick. Is that okay with you? Uh, so, if anyone else has a question, would you like to raise your hand virtually now, please? Okay, well, we've not got anyone just now, so I'll bring uh, Nick back in right now, but uh, please do indicate if you would like to speak. Thanks very much. Uh, Nick, do you want to go ahead and then I'll... Uh, I'll... I think uh, Ushma ah, has yeah. a question. Fantastic. Ushma, I'll bring you in right now. Um, hi, Nick. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, so I guess I've always been intrigued by the idea that, and it's not an idea, it's true, that borders are always seen as a place to be militarized and people, especially um, the most marginalized, are seen as things to be policed. I guess, um, how do you go about 
not just demilitarizing borders, but starting to demilitarize, demilitarize your own mind, because I think that's really, really where the change happens. Thanks so much. And I notice I also have a question from Charmaine, so I will bring you in as well, and then I'll hand it back over to Nick. Hey, okay, I think I'm unmuted. Uh, hey, Nick, how's it going? Um, so I guess my question is around um, um, just your analysis and how, um, sorry, how it um, can uh, speak to the dynamics around migration. Um, doing migrant justice here in Canada, very often um, businesses, um, you know, create splits between indigenous communities and migrants, especially around work, especially um, with a lot of, of um, you know, the farms around Toronto, for example, um, they're often pitted against each other, even though the workers are, you know, have no status and come on temporary uh, visas. So I'm wondering how your analysis around dispossession and capitalism um, can somehow not resolve those, um, um, those splits, but um, can kind of, um, I don't know, create a basis of unity perhaps around exploitation and oppression between two groups that are very far apart right now, politically. Thanks so much. So I'll hand you back uh, over to Nick. Uh, we've got questions from Matthew, Ushman and Charmaine, so if you could answer all three of those. And if you would like to ask Nick a question, please do raise your hand now uh, and I'll add you to the speaker stack. Yeah, I think uh, the question that Matthew had around um, how embedded uh, the idea of manifest destiny is within kind of the institutions of the United States, I think looking at like, it's, it's difficult to be like an indigenous person um, and see, you know, things really celebrating uh, somebody like Ruth Bader Ginsburg, right? And I understand that we're in this like really bad moment right now but it's fascinating to me that we've shifted so far to the right um, that people who would have been like 90s Republicans are now like Democrats and like, you know, liberals or whatever. Um, I always find that really fascinating because somebody like, you know, like Ruth Bader Ginsburg, you know, and I think it's important to understand this, like a lot of, in, uh, I don't want to speak on behalf of a lot of in, uh, every Indigenous person, but a lot of Indigenous people con confront their reality, you know, not through necessarily a class-based lens, or even one of like left and right, uh, so much as one uh, as understanding these things as colonial, right? Uh, as like, as it's a colonial, like they understand it through colonialism. And so if we look at like the Supreme Court um, and we think about how the Supreme Court under um, uh, John Marshall was, you know, ex expanded um, in that particular time, uh, the Supreme Court was relatively, you know, it wasn't something that was like a big institution uh, even under the even under the framing of the Constitution, but under John Marshall specifically, it expanded, and he saw kind of this expansive role of the Supreme Court. But it's also like a very undemocratic institution because they're selected by, um, you know, the president who's not voted by the the will of the people. He's a, he's so he's selected. He himself is selected by a, an electoral college. Like you know, it's like a rule by minority. You know, by minority, um, and that's something like James Madison was really about. But that's Besides the point, John Marshall went on to oversee a court that like really codified Indian law and, and indigenous sovereignty as we know it today, uh, had without really having any input from indigenous people themselves, right? Um, but nonetheless, the Marshall Trilogy has come to define the court and, and somebody like Ruth Bader Ginsburg may not like hold like, you know, like a personal like resentment towards indigenous people, even though she wrote some pretty inflammatory things like saying that indigenous sovereignty is just an ember that needs to be snuffed out. Um, that's pretty inflammatory. It's like basically saying that like, in, you know, indigenous nations should, it shouldn't exist anymore. And like this, they're holding on to, you know, they're just burning embers and they're gonna eventually go out. But she's not remembered for that. She's remembered for other things, her doily that she wore, I don't know. Um, um, but it's so like it becomes like the common sense and not like the common sense of like practical knowledge but it's like a, a sense that's held in common by settler society that it's just natural to be on these lands without really confronting indigenous people i believe one study found that only 23 percent of, of 
of white people uh, have ever met a real indigenous person or an authentic that indigenous person, whatever that means, um, because they think that we're all dead, right? Um, and that's why there's these convenient narratives like the doomed to die thesis that most people, most native people died of uh, biological you know, inferiority and they succumbed to pathogens they had no resistance to. We've all heard those, you know, those, um, those theories and, and those, uh, those myths. And this, you know, to, to get to your point about science, I think that's another thing too as well. Like you should all go read uh, or follow uh, Kim Talbert uh, on Twitter and then go read her book um, or do both. Um, there's no particular order. You can read her book, Native American DNA. They, science literally created race, right? Through genetics. There's no such thing as Native. I mean, there is, it, to some degree, it's a little bit question, but in reality, it's, there's no such thing as Native American DNA. It was, it was created, the idea that there's like African DNA and European DNA. Europe didn't exist when human, when DNA was, you know, when DNA, human DNA became a thing, but yet they, they you know, and Europe itself is a racial category, but nonetheless has been projected on, on DNA, on human genetics. Um, it's also been projected on indigenous people through native, you know, quote unquote, Native American DNA. Uh, but native, being indigenous is not defined by DNA, right? It's defined by relationships. So in some ways, science itself has naturalized uh, biology or even somebody like Elizabeth Warren, you know, to pick on, let's just pick on liberals. <laughs> um, somebody like Elizabeth Warren could just say, yeah, I have Native American DNA. That doesn't mean anything, right? And also it reduces uh, like 560 different indigenous nations to uh, biology. That's called racism. That's called race science. Like, let's call it what it is. It's like eugenics. Like, it's not even, it's not even attempting to hide it, right? But that's become the, the, the kind of the go-to, the default, right? And this kind of gets to uh, Ushma's question about demilitarizing your own mind. Because the idea uh, behind, uh, d you know, indigenous people is it's always, they're always vanishing, right? Um, blood quantum, you know, is tied to this idea of DNA as well, that we're always diminishing. We, we are, we are always, we're slowly becoming white. We're not slowly becoming black, right? Think about it that way. It's like black people, a lot of black people in this country have indigenous ancestry or are themselves indigenous, but nonetheless are not recognized uh, for it, right? But a white woman, you know, who lives in Boston, Massachusetts, who was a Republican for the majority of her life, can come out and say that she's indigenous and write a book, a Native American cookbook on being indigenous, but also benefit from, you know, affirmative action policies in Texas uh, for, for claiming to be American Indian. I was also claiming to be American Indian when she was at Harvard as well. And so thinking about demilitarization, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of people think that it's like, oh, it's just the military that eliminated indigenous people. But the most effective uh, policies, you know, if we think about politics as war by other means and, and war by politics, of, you know, is, is the expression of politics uh, through bloodshed, we can think about like Indian policy as a war by other means, in the sense that it was actually Indian policy that, that dispossessed uh, the majority of indigenous land. Uh, but it also was uh, indigenous policy that introduced things like the reservation system, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm not going to get to answer all that question. I'm running out of time. Uh, but the, the, the third question about migration um, by Charmaine, I think it's, it's interesting because the, the way that one gains kind of uh, success or a foothold in a settler society is through these kind of like normative channels of citizenship that automatically position somebody against indigenous nations, not by their own choosing necessarily, but it, it does in that way. And I think um, oftentimes in social justice move, in organizing spaces, we're, we're taught to kind of appeal to, to quote unquote power, right? And power is usually held by somebody in office, which is like a normative white institution, you know, um, that we often appeal to. And we're not like, we're not running to, you know, like a lot of these pipeline struggles are really amazing but oftentimes we appeal to politicians because they, we consider them having power. We're not running to like the migrant community and saying, hey, y'all should get behind this pipeline struggle. Um, that's not the, the, the reaction, right? Um, and so I think we have to actually think about where, how we understand power from a class-based perspective. You know, and this is why class is really important in decolonization. Power comes from below, it doesn't come from above. And those who, have, who don't have power, 
Many of them are migrant workers who are exploited, uh, who experience settler colonialism in a different way, but nonetheless are, are kind of implicated within that, that system itself. Um, it's important to understand building power from below versus like appealing to, to whiteness as like kind of the, you know, to triangulate our, our, um, our grievances or triangulate our complaints. Um, but we should actually be thinking about more horizontal uh, struggles and especially um, the, the fact, you know, the wage relation doesn't go away. You know, it's, it's still there even for indigenous people, even if they're not working, you know, unemployment is a relation to capital itself just as much as employment is. Uh, but I could go on and on about that. I, I won't do that here, but I recommend everyone read, you know, Harsha Walia's work. Um, she's written quite extensively about it and it's, she's, you know, the expert on it, so to speak. Thanks very much, Nick, for those incredibly thoughtful answers. Um, because we're running out of time a little bit, I'm going to ask that you are a tiny little bit less thoughtful uh, in your responses to the next questions. I'll take one more round uh, and then I'll ask you to answer those questions and then just uh, come up with any concluding remarks you'd like to say. So first, I have a question from Ben. He sent this question in. He asks, have water protectors had any luck contacting rank and file workers among those involved in building the pipeline or related trades? Uh, so that's the first question. Uh, and then in the stack, I've got Graham and Ricardo. Uh, Graham, I will uh, take you first. If both of you could be fairly brief in your questions, though. Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll be really quick, but uh, going off of what you were saying about Elizabeth Warren, I'm from Oklahoma, and the recent kind of return of tribal land that just happened is really big and monumental, and I was just wondering what you thought about that in relation to the future of decolonizing the U.S. Thanks very much, Graham. Uh, Ricardo, you're unmuted. Go ahead. Uh, hi, Nick. I completely agree with the idea that all struggles are struggles against fossil capitalism. Um, I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on how to make people in the streets aware of that. I agree with that. I just wanted to hear more, your thoughts more on that. I know the Red Deal does some of that work, but if you can just give some more thoughts, that'd be great. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ricardo. Well, I will hand back over to Nick uh, to answer those questions and again, to provide any final thoughts that you'd like to give us. Yeah, so for the question about organized labor, um, there were like, uh, organized, there were uh, some unions who were embedded in the camps and there was a labor camp actually, not like the labor camp you get sent to, but <laughs> there was a camp that was dedicated to labor in uh, organized labor in Standing Rock. Um, and they've actually, a lot of them have been allied with indigenous struggles. And there's actually a history of organized labor being allied with indig indigenous struggles. It's not to say that they're automatically antagonistic. Uh, even in South Dakota, for example, um, there's a steel workers union that came out against Keystone XL because the, the unionized labor that they're using is comes from the outside, right? Um, so there's kind of this weird like, a thing like, oh, well, they're not even hiring like local labor. Uh, but the other part of it is, um, you know, like the organization, unions like the National Nurses Union um, has, you know, always stood with indigenous sovereignty. They've, they've been really um, great allies. I've worked, I've worked with them. They're super amazing. They're very, like, they're probably like the vanguard of like the labor movement, I would say. Also the fact that they're care workers and the, the fact that they're like many, many of them are women of color, you know, or non-men, um, I think says something about like how we understand labor because a lot of these extractive jobs just go to white dudes, you know? I mean, that's the majority of, of them. And so and they also, they're not, they don't constitute a majority of, um, of the workforce, nor do they constitute like, they're, they're definitely like a big economy and I don't want to minimize it, they're a major industry but they're not the major industry, right? And I, I always, you know, like, it's important to, you know, to, to recognize this class solidarity, but also to understand, you know, it's not just about winning over the workers themselves, but thinking about work in general um, and, and the expansive definitions of what it means. But yeah, there, you know, that was, uh, there were water protectors, are, we're currently are working with unions and they've, a lot of them have been really um, uh, amenable to uh, indigenous sovereignty, believe it or not. Um, but it's also, there's like a lot of debate as well. Um, this, the second question on um, the McGirt decision, I, I think that's what you're talking about. Uh, it's important to point out that the McGirt decision, um, you know, I have, I have the decision right here sitting in front of me because um, I'm a nerd. But the McGirt decision, 
uh, the majority or the, the, the opinion was actually written by Gorsuch, right? He's a conservative judge. Why would Gorsuch write this? Um, he's a textualist. He's, you know, he's like, he believes in the original intent of the law. You know, um, that's me mocking him. But uh, <laughs> what's fascinating about that is that, like, it shows that, like, you know, that if we understand, like, the colonial relation, like, somebody like Gorsuch can be amenable to, like, indigenous sovereignty, right? Um, because if you just read the law, like, this is not like a, this isn't a revolutionary decision. It's just like, yeah, we should just follow the law. Um, it's like, it's like, you know, the expectation of um, white people not to be racist. It's like, yeah, just be a decent human being. You know, it's like, you don't, you should get a sticker for that. Uh, but I also think that the McGirt decision has uh, larger implications. It wasn't actually the return of land necessarily, but it was specifically about criminal jurisdiction, saying that the tribes never had their criminal jurisdiction extinguished uh, in the eastern part of, of Oklahoma. This raises a larger question because we have, you know, uh, ongoing efforts at land back uh, where this could help aid uh, in, in those struggles. If we think about getting arrested within treaty territory that was never ceded, like uh, jurisdiction uh, to like the state in places like South Dakota and you get arrested and you're in treaty territory, does that, you know, does that law enforcement agency have the authority to arrest you? You know, so there's a, a lot of questions. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that tomorrow. Um, thinking about the question of land back and like the the role of McGirt in, in that in that um in that uh, struggle the the last one was about uh from ricardo about how uh making people aware that these are climate struggles i think first of all it's like it's more the onus if we think about like um i just completely forgot her name the the swedish person that came over to the united states um i can't remember her name Greta Thunberg. She became the symbol of the environmental movement, right? Which, and it's not to like bash Greta Thunberg, but somebody needed to think about optics. A European crossing the Atlantic in a boat into, you know, into the Eastern seaboard to help save us. Like, I, I don't know, like it's not, it's probably not what I would have picked. Um, but I also think that like, like black, like the, the, the black land projects that are ongoing right now are actually at the forefront of a lot of climate uh, change uh, policy, but they're not, they're, they only can be read as kind of like police abolitionists or, you know, uh, abolitionist movements, uh, as if abolition is only about like the prison or the, or the police themselves and not about um, black people's relationships with land or lack thereof and how they've been racialized as non-owners of land or have been excluded from land ownership in general. Um, so I think about like uh, about that because it's like community control and community autonomy is just as important as like indigenous sovereignty and they're not like competing frameworks and in fact they they should be working together and if indigenous sovereignty is at the forefront of climate justice then so too is community uh, control especially within black communities around like food sovereignty right uh, and that begins with, uh, you know, the police are, I would say like, you know, police implement a form of class rule, right? And I, I don't need to explain that to, to black, you know, black communities about like that experience. Like it's, it prevents one from building political power and it operates uh, also, you know, alongside of just like the everyday forms of white supremacy that happen through vigilante violence, policing, you know, you have the Karen phenomenon, right? Of white women calling the police on, on black people or indigenous people, you know, um, so everyday settlers are encouraged to enact, you know, anti-blackness or anti-indigeneity by mobile, like by becoming agents of the state, right? And so when we when we talk about that, and we talk about who controls the land and what the land is used for, and if it's benefiting uh, people or not, we can see is like the primary obstacle to that, right? Is like black people can't even exist in public, right, without being surveilled. That's a problem. That's to me, that's that's part of their environment. It's a toxic environment that has been, you know, imposed on them to prevent them from building political power or to to constantly curtail it, right? And so, I think it's incumbent upon more so less uh, uh, black and indigenous communities than it is, um, you know, non-indigenous and non-black communities to make those arguments, to make those connections within their movements. Because frankly, the environmental movement is still a majority non-white or it's a majority white movement. You know, and it has like, it's, it's allied 
kind of tenuously with a with a middle class kind of like liberal politic, right? That tends to be white. So uh, we have to really challenge that, and we have to like also not cede the ground um, to them and say like let them define the terms of struggle, right? And also not let people like Greta Thunberg come in to stand for climate justice. We we have our own water, the water protector. You know that's that's an that's an amazing category because anybody who walked through those gates, whether you're indigenous or not, became a water protector by default, right? It wasn't a racial or kind of a category of being indigenous. It was one, it was one of responsibility and a relationality to the land itself, right? So that has a much more like revolutionary potential than just calling oneself, you know, uh, oh, I'm I'm gonna you know, I'm an environmentalist or you know, I, you know, I, I want to participate in the environmental movement in this way, in this way, but actually like enacting those principles in practice, um, I think is important. But remember, Water Protector came from indigenous people. It's an indigenous led movement. So there's also uh, an acknowledgement of leadership in that moment as well. I hope that answers your question. Well, again, I would like to say on behalf of everyone, thank you so much, Nick. It was fantastic uh, having you with us today. So uh, I'll take everyone, I'll give everyone a moment to give you a, a silent round of applause. Um, again, if you haven't already, please go to the Havens Right Centre website and register for uh, the talk with Nick tomorrow. That'll be exactly the same time. Uh, and also please check out all of the other events that uh, we have coming up. I've, I've um, already received a few more questions coming in uh, in the chat for Nick, uh, so I'm sure there's going to be a lively uh, discussion um, uh, uh, tomorrow. Okay, thanks so much everyone. Uh, I hope you have a lovely night and I'll see you all tomorrow. Bye.